Hey guys, welcome to IB7 Economist. So today in this video, we will be going over demand and supply side policies. This is going to come in handy, especially when doing part B questions. So listen up. Let's begin with demand side policies. Like the name says, these are policies implemented by the government that will shift the aggregate demand curve. There are really only two types of demand side policies, fiscal and monetary policy. Fiscal policy refers to when the government changes taxes for government spending. Expansionary fiscal policy is aimed to stimulate economic growth. The government will decrease taxes and increase spending, causing C, I, and G to increase. And when components of AD increase, AD will shift outwards. Contractionary fiscal policy is the opposite. Government will increase taxes and decrease spending in order to decrease AD. It's aimed to contract the economy when there's overgrowth. Let's go into a little evaluation here about the pros and cons of fiscal policy. Fiscal policy includes government spending. It can also potentially influence the long-run aggregate supply curve and cause long-run economic growth. For example, if the government spending is used on education, in the long run, the quality of labor will improve and the productive capacity will increase. Now, in these three situations, fiscal policy will come in handy. Number one, when GDP and AD are too high, contractionary fiscal policy is the appropriate response. Number two, fiscal policy can be used to close the recessionary and deflationary gap. As for what that is, check out our notes on the business cycle. Number three, Fiscal policy is the right response to demand efficient unemployment. This will be covered more in the unemployment notes. So fiscal policy is great to use in these situations, but it also has its flaws. Because fiscal policy requires the government to spend money, it can result in a budget deficit and accumulated debt. Furthermore, the government spending may crowd out private investment and consumption. For this, we have to look at the market for loanable funds. The government spending will cause the demand to shift upwards, resulting in an increase in interest. In response to this, consumption and investment will decrease, and so will AD, thus making the fiscal policy completely ineffective. Also, even though lowering taxes does give people extra income, consumers might choose to save that income rather than spend it, thus proving the policy ineffective. There is also a time lag for fiscal policy to become effective, and by the time it actually works, the situation might have already changed. Monetary policy, on the other hand, is done through the central bank, not the government. It's when they change the interest rate and money supply. Expansionary monetary policy involves an increase in money supply and a decrease in interest rates. Lowering the cost of borrowing money will entice consumers and firms to spend rather than save, thus increasing investment and consumption and, in turn, AD. Contractionary policy will decrease interest rates by decreasing money supply, and this decreases AD. So now, let's evaluate monetary policy. Like fiscal policy, monetary policy is great when closing recessionary and inflationary gaps and when fighting demand-efficient inflation. It also has much less of a time lag than fiscal policies and allows for AD to be fine-tuned. Furthermore, because we're adjusting the monetary supply here, crowding out consumption and investment isn't a problem. However, expansionary monetary policy will not increase the long-run aggregate supply curve because it isn't investing in anything. Monetary policy can also prove to be ineffective when the general confidence level is low. People don't want to spend no matter how low you make the interest rate. You also run a high risk of loan defaults during times such as the recession. And even though we said it has less of a time lag, there is still a time lag. So that's always a complaint. But like fiscal policy, its major problem is that it may be solely inflationary in the long run. Supply side policies are aimed at increasing the long run aggregate supply which is influenced by the quantity and quality of the factors of production. There are two major types, interventionist, where the government directly weighs in, and market-based, where the government sort of provides stimulation for things. Like, it gives the situation a shove. It's important to keep in mind that for many supply-side policies, AD will also shift along with AS. And for a lot of situations, we will be shifting the long-run aggregate supply which results in the snowflake diagram and everything shifting outwards. Let's go to the interventionist solutions first. 
Number one, education. In my opinion, this is the best one. I always put it on top. Government investment in education will increase the quality of labor and thus increase the long-run aggregate supply. Number two, research and development. Government subsidies to research and development can lead to the development of a new product, like a drug that can save lives, or new and more efficient technology. This causes the long-run aggregate supply to shift outward. Number three, infrastructure. Government investments in large-scale capital needed for economic activity, such as roads, water supply, or electricity, increases the productivity and efficiency of firms, which definitely increases the productive capacity. The long-run aggregate supply shifts up. Number four, industrial policies. This one refers to policies targeting specific industries to subsidize for growth. Depending on what industry it is, long-run aggregate supply may or may not shift outwards. A good indicator is externalities. If there are positive externalities, long-run aggregate supply will likely shift outwards. In all cases, however, short-run aggregate supply will definitely shift outwards. As for market-based solutions, you basically need to remember taxes and get rid of any limitations we have on the free market. Here are a few market-based solutions. Number one, income tax cut. So this one will increase both aggregate demand and short-run aggregate supply. Lowering taxes gives people more incentive to work and also increases the opportunity cost of not working. This will cause an increase in labor and thus a decrease in wages because of the surplus of labor. As more people have jobs and are earning more money, they will consume more. Thus, both short-run aggregate supply and AD will shift outwards, vice versa for tax raise. Short-run aggregate supply and aggregate demand will shift inwards. Number two, corporate tax cut. This is similar to the income tax cut. Firms will have more money to invest and to put into research and development. Thus, both aggregate demand and aggregate supply will shift outwards. Actually, if the money is going towards research and development, then long-run aggregate supply also shifts to the right. Number three, a decrease in social welfare or unemployment benefits. The opportunity cost of not working goes up and people will have to start working more. Then, it's the same labor mechanism that causes short-run aggregate supply to shift outwards. Number four, labor market reform. This means getting rid of minimum wage, reducing the power of unions, reducing payroll taxes, and other things that decrease the cost of labor to firms, which thus increases short-run aggregate supply. Number five, policies that will encourage competition, privatization, paid liberation, deregulation. Anything that will force firms to increase their efficiency and be more productive will shift the short-run aggregate supply outwards. Now, let's jump to evaluation. Unlike demand-side policies, supply-side policies don't need to worry about being solely inflationary in the long run and is the right response for stagflation. They also solve cost-push inflation and can decrease the natural rate of unemployment. We will be talking more about that on the inflation unit and the unemployment unit. A lot of the supply-side policies will increase the long-run aggregate supply, which means they will increase the potential output of the economy, which is definitely a plus. In those respects, supply-side policies are great, but we also have to take into consideration that they might not work. If we decrease income tax or corporate tax, people might choose to save the money or still choose not to work because they're lazy and want to enjoy more leisure. We also have to consider this from an economic development standpoint. Decreasing minimum wage and unemployment benefits may be good for stimulating the economy, but it's bad for equity and development because the quality of life for low income and unemployed people decreases and we're losing an automatic stabilizer. Supply side policies also don't smooth out the business cycle. If anything, it makes the fluctuations worse. And that's it for this video. Thank you for tuning in to IB7 Economist. Good luck surviving the IB wilderness.